Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to our talk tonight. My name is Dr. Mita Patel. I am one of the OBGYN physicians at Orange Coast Women's Medical Group. We work in partnership with Hoag. Um, I am proudly serving the offices of Foothill Ranch, Tustin, Laguna Hills, and um, Irvine on Sand Canyon Avenue. So I'm happy to be discussing today how to plan for pregnancy and getting a head start so that um, there are as little surprises as possible and I'm here to answer any questions you have related to what um, it could entail in terms of trying to get pregnant or during pregnancy. So let's get started. First, what we kind of entail as pre-pregnancy health is something we call preconception health. So prior to getting pregnant, there are a lot of things that come into play that we want to potentially um, potentially be aware of so that we can make sure that when you do get pregnant that we are on the same page and that we're taking the appropriate steps to help you have a nice, healthy, and safe pregnancy. So with preconception health, um, the goals can be to help prevent pregnancy complications due to existing conditions such as diabetes or high blood pressure. And some of these things, it's helpful to get a grip on before getting pregnant. So if we can meet for a preconception visit, there are things we can talk about. And if we need to meet with specialists ahead of time, we can just make sure that we connect the dots and we have every, all our ducks in a row so that um, there's no surprises as we go through the pregnancy. But also as part of a preconception checkup, um, we then talk about what are appropriate supplements to take, what maybe you should stop taking depending on what you're already on, and if there's certain medications that you use, um, we can talk about if it is something that is going to be beneficial to you during pregnancy or if there's any risks involved, and we can kind of balance those out with each other. So what I, what I normally recommend is that we start thinking about these things three months before you start trying to get pregnant. I know sometimes it happens and we can't plan ahead, but if, if we are planning ahead, a good amount of time is usually three months before starting to try. So kind of a little checklist we have for what can you do when you're wanting to start trying. And um, number one step, usually it would involve stopping any birth control methods. That would be somewhat important, but Based on what birth control method you are using, um, we could have a discussion about how quickly would you return to fertility. And for most forms of birth control, it's right away. But there are a few exceptions, so um, that's something we could talk about at a preconception visit. Another thing we could talk about is how to start tracking your cycle. So a lot of people download fertility apps, and those are really good at tracking when your period is and kind of knowing what your fertility window is. And um, the science behind that is basically ovulation is necessary to um, get pregnant, obviously. So the sperm needs to meet the egg. And so tracking your cycle helps us know when that egg is ovulating so that we know when we can make sure the sperm are around to meet the egg. And that's usually um, a couple days, three days before you ovulate, the day you ovulate, and the day after. So there's other ways to track ovulation, and the most common way I recommend is usually um, either timing it with an app or using an ovulation predictor kit, which can be found in your local pharmacy. But um, another way to kind of prepare yourself for pregnancy is to make sure that you're taking a prenatal vitamin. Um, it's best to try to start taking it three months before trying to conceive, and the main things that a prenatal vitamin should include are folic acid, iron, and um, DHA. And so those are the three of the most important things that we look for in a vitamin. Um, we also encourage strongly to try to quit drinking and smoking ahead of time. A lot of times, you know, people get scared that they did something, they drank that first week, they didn't know they were pregnant, and it all could be fine, but if you're trying to plan ahead, then it would be a good plan to try to minimize that. And getting active ahead of time is actually very um, important because during pregnancy, we don't want to add on new exercises or new uh, weight loss regimens. Um, 
And getting active ahead of time gets your body acclimated to a certain cardiovascular health level, like a heart healthy level, so that when you are pregnant, you can continue that activity level and you um, then can you know, maintain a healthy pregnancy that way because activity and uh, physical fitness is important during pregnancy. But what I normally tell my patients is if you're not already doing CrossFit, I don't want you to, pregnancy is not the time to start doing that. So if you can get to that peak fitness ahead of time or what your goal is, then you are able to continue it. Um, so that's just one thing to think about. And then visiting the dentist, if you want to have a checkup, is better to do that ahead of time than during pregnancy because there are things that have to modify when you are pregnant. So just, just a little thing to think about. So like we talked about earlier, it is best to consult with um, an OBGYN about three months before you're trying to get pregnant so that we can go through all those um, pre-existing conditions you might have, go through your medication list, try to help you make sure that there's nothing that will increase your chance of um, birth defects or you know, miscarriage, preterm birth. Those are just uh, quick things we can go through to help reassure you that what you're doing is probably fine. So um, there's a lot of medications that are safe to take during pregnancy, but that is very specific to what you're using it for and um, how important it is for you to be on that medication. So those are things that we can go through in detail. And then, like I was talking about with fitness and diet, those are aspects that we can assess to come up with a plan ahead of time to try to manage, to know what is appropriate while trying to conceive and at the beginning of pregnancy, things like that. So throughout the pregnancy and um, childbirth, all the things that come into play, no matter what trimester you're in, are taking those prenatal vitamins like we talked about, staying extra hydrated. Um, during pregnancy, you, even if you dr think you drink a lot of water, it's usually never enough. So staying hydrated is key. Usually six to eight 16 ounce bottles is what I normally recommend. So um, that's something I, we reiterate at every pregnancy visit. And then staying on top of your prenatal care is important. Just going to the visits. A normal prenatal care course looks like this. So we normally see you around eight weeks for your first visit, and then we see you every four weeks um, through the first two trimesters, which is until 28 weeks. And then it becomes more frequent. We see you every two weeks until you get to about 36 weeks pregnant, and then it's weekly until the time of birth. So also throughout the pregnancy, um, we, we encourage you to listen to your body and manage your stress and eating habits because there are things that can arise that are normal, but there are things that can be signs that you may not think are um, an issue. And as long as you're open with your doctor, then we can work together to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Um, and so pregnancy is a time to enjoy. And um, some people get a little more nausea than others, or some people have a little bit more back pain. But overall, what I tell my patients is people wouldn't have multiple babies if they were miserable. So people get through it. They have, um, you know, that baby to hold in their arms and they forget about any little aches or pains they had. So overall, it's a time to um, enjoy and uh, cherish so that you can remember that whole process. In terms of the timeline of pregnancy, we kind of talked about this. Um, the uh, pregnancy is essentially nine months, but we measure it in terms of 40 weeks being when your due date is, because we use that first four weeks um, as counting it from when your period starts. So that kind of ends up adding a month. So technically, nine months is the course of a pregnancy. But in terms of how we calculate it, that's why it ends up looking like 10 months when we say that 40, at 40 weeks pregnant is your due date. So that can be a little confusing. But we can um, clarify that for you in terms of what your due date is. And um, there's a lot of apps that also, basically, if you put your first day of your last period, that's how we calculate what your due date is. So that is something helpful to keep track of. The first trimester goes through the um, first 12 to 13 weeks. And so during the first trimester, um, there is a pretty big adjustment period. That's when you are starting to go through all these changes related to the hormone levels increasing. 
Um, you can have, start to have more tender swollen breasts. Your weight could fluctuate. Not it might even go down during the first trimester because there are, um, there's a lot more nausea and vomiting at this time because one of the hormone levels is very high during the first trimester called progesterone. And so this might alter what you want to eat. Usually when people are having nausea, carbs are something that they can stomach very well. So this is a time it's okay to eat um, small amounts, but frequently because this helps your stomach empty out. And so as your stomach um, empties, then there's less food that would back up to make you feel nauseous and have vomiting. So this is the time of the pregnancy where eating small amounts is pretty good idea to try and minimize that nausea and vomiting. But there are medications we can give and some over-the-counter things that help with nausea and vomiting. So just make sure, even if your first visit isn't scheduled till eight weeks, that you contact us at the office and we can let you know what we recommend because um, we're here for you even during that time. Some other things that you might notice are fatigue, dizziness, increased urination, some constipation, some heartburn, may, some light bleeding even potentially. These are all a, potentially normal changes that occur during this first trimester. So when it comes to details of what you're feeling, um, just make sure to bring it up to us so that we can go through that with you. But as far as light bleeding goes, it is very common to have light bleeding early in pregnancy and 90% of the time when someone has bleeding in that first trimester, it goes on to be a normal pregnancy. So that's a really reassuring stat. As far as emotions go, those can run high at this time too, maybe throughout the whole pregnancy, but especially throughout the first trimester, you might have some of these mood swings that you feel like you can't explain why they're going on. But a lot of, a lot of these changes have to do with the hormone levels fluctuating. So being... Uh, a good communicator with your partner, with your doctor, with your support system is very important so that they know how you feel and how um, they can be of help to you. So a lot of people do have cravings during the first trimester um, and some of them can be pretty in funny combinations, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. So the second trimester is between the 13th week to the um, usually 26 to 28 week mark. Um, <clears throat> so at that time, this is kind of a turning point because until you get to 20 weeks pregnant, you won't really feel the baby move. So at that point, it can be a little bit of a scary time as you go from third, you know, first trimester to the middle of the second trimester, your symptoms of feeling pregnant might start to go away, which is a nice thing, but then it might be a little disheartening because it's hard to know what's going on and if everything's okay because you don't feel a baby move yet. So your belly might start to grow a little bit, your skin might start to get a little more dry, you might start to get weight gain, um, your gums might start to get more sensitive, you might start to have more nasal um, congestion. A lot of these things have to do with estrogen levels. And then what Braxton Hicks contractions are, are what we call false contractions and that has a lot to do with dehydration. So this is a really crucial time to really stay hydrated to make sure that if you do have contractions that we know that it's not from dehydration um, and that we make sure um, that we take care of things as needed. But some other side effects of pregnancy can include the increased risk of getting a blood clot deep in your leg. So it's something that's really important to make sure that you're having good circulation and swelling can be normal, but if you can um, get some compression socks that kind of go up to your knee, that's a good way to help keep your blood pumping up because what happens in pregnancy is our blood volume goes up and um, a lot of it pools at the bottom because we're standing or on our feet. So that's why you can have swelling, but pregnancy can also increase your risk of blood clots. And so getting that circulation moving will help minimize that risk, not only of swelling, but also the blood clot. And so that also becomes very important if you do travel during pregnancy, that you want to make sure that you're walking every 30 minutes to one hour, because that way um, you get that circulation going, you wear those compression stockings, and while you're seated, you, you can kind of elevate your feet. That should help too. Um, and so moving on to the third trimester from up until 
week 40. So we say that week 40 is kind of the due date, but I, what I tell my patients is it's kind of really a due month because term pregnancies are essentially between 37 weeks and usually mid week, sorry, the mid of, middle of week 41. So usually if you deliver at any time in that range, that's considered normal. So 37 weeks is kind of the goal um, for a term pregnancy and you can kind of count that back three weeks from your due date. So during that third trimester, you might start to get some stretch marks, some back aches, some more swelling. Um, you might start to feel a little more short of breath, start to have more heartburn as the um, belly expands, because what happens is it pushes up on your lungs, your lung capacity decreases a little. All these changes are normal, and there's a lot of physiologic changes that happen um, that you may not expect, what happened during pregnancy because um, it, it, it's just like, you know, you have a person growing in you, but why is my body changing? Well, there's a lot of things that come from the hormone levels like we talked about earlier and even just from the physics of it, from having some little, little guy or little girl just occupying your space, you know, like being in your bubble. So um, some things that you can do to help that are get a belly band, like a pregnancy belt to help kind of support the pregnancy up. Um, wearing some tight-fitting yoga pants, that can help a lot too. And we also always have physical therapy available to people who are having um, a lot of discomfort. They work really well with our pregnant patients to help minimize any back pain or sometimes pelvic pain can be pretty intense during pregnancy. So we have a lot of ways to help manage these things. And then um, heartburn is a big issue that arises in a lot of patients and so, um, that's something that we can make sure to uh, talk about at our visits, but I just want to tell you off the bat, Tums is safe to take, so it doesn't hurt to have a bottle of Tums around in your kitchen or in your medicine cabinet for when you do get pregnant. And so kind of going back to the first trimester, so as we go through the pregnancy, we have, um, we have the visits like we talked about every four weeks, but at every visit, it's kind of a little bit different. And so towards the very beginning of the pregnancy, um, something that we talk about at the first visit and usually draw blood for or start to perform at the second visit is something called genetic screening. And so there's, um, in terms of genetic carrier screening, this is something that if you carry the gene for a disease, it doesn't necessarily mean that you personally have the disease and you could never know that you carry this gene because you need the genetic makeup from both sides, from a mom and a dad, to then be a, an affected um, person. And so there are certain, these diseases can include like cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, muscular dystrophy. So those are things that we could, we offer to test them during the first trimester, but this is also something we could check for uh, you ahead of pregnancy at your preconception visit because if you are a carrier for a disease, then um, we would test your partner. And then usually for most of these diseases, there's only a 25% chance of having an affected child in this case, one out of four. But there are ways then we can talk about if based on the significance of that disease or um, how, how um, troublesome it could be to have a child with that disease, there are ways to, um, talk about screening um, like an embryo for these diseases. And this would kind of be going down the um, IVF route if we wanted to test an embryo ahead of time. But these are also tests that we do during pregnancy because if there's something going on, then a lot of times parents, one, like to know um, just to be mentally prepared, or two, sometimes some of these conditions could be something that you wouldn't, some parents don't wanna put a child through, so there are options, you know, for continuing the pregnancy in um, the way you choose. So that's why we have these tests available. In terms of nutrition, exercise, and healthy eating tips, we kind of went over this at the beginning um, in a little bit of detail, but uh, as for foods to avoid, the number one thing is usually undercooked meats. So sushi is a big kicker for a lot of people um, for those uncooked rolls. 
I also, one thing that is um, surprising to people are like under, or sorry, deli meats. So just like a turkey sandwich, that's a cold piece of meat that could harbor some bacteria. So deli meats, sausages, things like that need to be microwaved till they're scalding hot to kind of kill off all that bacteria. As for fruits and vegetables, I do recommend washing everything so that you get any bacteria off because even if you're not eating the skin, when you cut through with a knife, you don't want to transfer anything to the inside. And um, unpasteurized products are another thing we want to um, avoid just to avoid any um, infection with certain bacteria like listeria. And as for um, coffee, that's a big question I always get. How much coffee can I have? So one cup of coffee, 200 milligrams maximum of caffeine is what we normally say. So one trick is if you're really a big coffee drinker and you need your two, three cups a day, what I normally recommend is trying to do half caffeine because it's not the coffee, it's the caffeine. So if you, or sorry, half decaf. So if you can do a half caffeine, half decaf cup, you can have your two cups per day. So there's, there's a lot of little tricks like this. Um, that we can talk about at most of your visits. Um, so to also iterate on health during pregnancy, weight gain is something that is actually very important during pregnancy. So based on your starting weight, at your first visit, we'll kind of talk about what your weight gain goal is for that pregnancy. Um, usually for someone at a normal starting weight, below what we call a body mass index or BMI of 25, the weight gain goal is 25 to 35 pounds. And so that's not something that you necessarily need to be keeping track of yourself. That's something we keep track of during your pregnancy and you know we'll let you know if you're on track or not. So um, that's also part of those prenatal visits. And then we talked about staying hydrated. Also, I would recommend avoiding um, sugar drinks or caffeine drinks because caffeine one if you're taking a lot in makes you dehydrated because caffeine makes you pee a lot more and then sugar-free drinks are an easy or drinking juices and things with sugar is kind of a very high density of sugar all taken at once which could be a risk factor to develop diabetes during pregnancy and that's an easy way to avoid trying to increase your sugar intake during pregnancy. So substituting it with water is kind of like a very good goal um, to, it, to have. And if that's something you struggle with, even trying to develop that habit before becoming pregnancy so that you don't have that dependency or that craving during pregnancy is a good idea. Um, and we talked about physical activity. If you're someone who's not normally an exerciser, I still recommend getting out there for 30 minutes a day, taking a walk. After dinner is a good time to help um, empty your stomach faster, digest better, avoid that heartburn that you might have at night. And so that physical activity helps prevent a lot of um, issues from arising during pregnancy, like with your blood pressure, or with possible gestational diabetes. So physical activity is, is crucial. So some things to avoid during pregnancy, we've kind of talked about each of these things um, as we've gone through the slides, but this is a list that you can refer back to. Um, and it's also a list that we can print you and give you at your prenatal visits. So dads out there, you do play a role. You, I know that um, it, sometimes dads do feel disconnected because they're, they're not physically carrying the pregnancy. Um, and right now with COVID, it is, it is difficult because we aren't having partners come into the rooms with the um, moms for the visits, but we do encourage partners to FaceTime in, to call in, to be on um, speakerphone because it is important that you get your questions answered and that you, um, you, you make sure that you can feel involved too because you're the emotional support for your partner. Um, she's going through a lot of changes that she may be confused about. And so it's important to listen and just be understanding. And the communication part could not be more important. It's just knowing what each other needs and how to be there for each other. And for moms too, it's really important that um, you communicate to your partners because the guys can't read your minds. That's what 
a common thing that I tell people. So you, ha you have to let them know what you need and what you're thinking. Um, even if it's something with like, I really don't want to sweep the floor today, would you mind helping me with that? Like, just be open with each other and that'll help you guys get through the pregnancy uh, more easily together. All right, so I'd love to take your guys' questions now. Thank you. Um, so the first question I have is, should I avoid hot tubs during pregnancy? And the answer is yes. We don't want you going um, in any temperature um, higher than a normal bath you might take um, through your faucet in your uh, bathroom because you, exposing the baby to that high of heat is not ideal. Um, heating pads can be okay when you're having um, some back pain or if you're having some pain on the sides um, in your groin. So heating pads are okay, but hot tubs are a big no. So as for a prenatal vitamin brand or a prescription, there's no um, recommendation for one being better than the other. As long as they have those ingredients like we talked about, um, folic acid, iron, and DHA, those are three of the things that sometimes can fluctuate between prenatal vitamins, but otherwise everything else is standard. Folic acid should be standard too, but sometimes the gummy vitamins don't have iron in them, so just make sure if you're taking a gummy to check for the iron component. And some of the older prenatal vitamins don't have DHA in them, so just um, double check the label um, for DHA, and if they don't have it in there, you can take a uh, supplemental DHA on the side. This is a good question. How safe is it to deliver during the pandemic? So in terms of kind of protocols that we have at the hospital, um, right now we are having just the partner um, or one support person come in to the delivery room with the patient and um, we're taking you know, very good precautions. Everyone wears a proper PPE and we are testing all moms um, that come in in labor to make sure they're, if they're COVID negative or COVID positive. In terms of how safe it is to be pregnant during this time and come to doctor's visits, we are taking good precautions in our office as well, trying to cut down wait times in the um, waiting rooms to make sure that everyone's distance appropriately. But it is based on your comfort level and how you um, feel about being exposed while visiting you know, the hospital or being around other um, people. But I will say one thing that's good about an OBGYN's office is that we see a lot of healthy patients. We don't, we don't see sick patients. So everyone that comes through our door is pre-screened and made sure they don't have any symptoms. And most of the time, we're not seeing anyone for a sick visit anyway. So we're pretty comforted by that. Sorry, I think I already went through those. Is genetic screening usually or rarely covered by insurance? So I would say that, um, thank you. It depends on um, what your insurance is and your age. And so there are certain tests that are covered for women 35 and older that are not covered for uh, women under 35 because being 35 years old um, puts you in a category called advanced maternal age, which sounds much more horrible than it is. But um, that is because as we get a little older, um, we could be at more increased risk for having issues like Down syndrome um, and some genetic conditions like that. So there are certain tests that are only covered when you're 35 and older, but there are tests that um, are covered by insurance for those same diseases. They're just a different type and may not be um, exactly the test you want. And I'm being kind of vague about that, but a lot of people ask about the test called the non-invasive prenatal test where you can find out the gender of the baby early. And even though that is a possibility with that non-invasive prenatal test, the reason that test is there is to check for certain diseases like Down syndrome, trisomy 18, trisomy 13. And so women who are over the age of 35 are more at risk for those um, conditions and so, or for the babies to have those conditions. And so that's why that test is covered 
for the, um, women 35 and over. Um, as for um, the rest of the test, it also depends on the panels that we choose because for genetic carrier screening, there are some basic um, panels that check for the more common diseases and then there are more advanced panels that check for more rare diseases. So that also varies by insurance type. So that's something we can go into detail um, at a visit together. So I've, I think I have like three or four cards here about the COVID vaccine. So the COVID vaccine is, you know, rolling out and we do have a governing body called ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs. And that recommendation has come out that we should be off, we can offer um, COVID vaccines to women who are trying to get pregnant, who are pregnant or who are uh, breastfeeding. But the caveat is no pregnant women were directly um, studied when these vaccines were being tested. And so we don't have any direct data saying everything with pregnant women um, came out to have good outcomes. But that being said, the type of vaccine this is, um, it's not a live vaccine, which means it's not something that we um, anticipate should, based on the science behind that type of vaccine, should cross over to the placenta or cause problems. But we can't say with certainty um, that it is uh, complete, completely without risk. However, it is kind of about balancing the benefits and risk. So the benefits could be for certain people who work in high risk um, jobs or essential workers, or if people really want the vaccine, there's no recommendation to discourage pregnant women or women trying to conceive to get the vaccine. So as far as how soon should I try to get pregnant after having a miscarriage, um, that question can vary depending on um, the way that the miscarriage occurred, whether there, if it, everything passed on its own or if you had um, taken medication for it. We basically need to know that everything has um, come out. And so usually as long as we know that your hormone level has dropped to normal, it can take um, two to three cycles for your period to come back to a regular normal cycle. So I usually say three months, but there's really no right answer. Technically, you could get pregnant right away after having a miscarriage. Um, and so that's something that we that might be um, talked about better as a specific question related to what your situation was. I'm sorry that you had to go through that. So the last question I want to answer today is um, pregnancy books. Uh, a lot of people have heard of the book, What to Expect When Expecting. I usually recommend that, not necessarily that you need to get the book. I would say most of my um, patients and colleagues say that the app is sufficient for what to expect when expecting. Um, some of the other books, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the names. I told them earlier I was going to blank on the names. I have them written down here so because I knew I would. So Moms on Call is a book that I recommend to a lot of patients. It's written by nurses, um, and so it gives a nice kind of medical um, perspective on things. And um, if you're someone like me who's really into like data and science and kind of having the like objective facts, there's a book called Crib Sheets. Um, that is written by an economist that really helps to kind of break things down um, in a kind of objective manner, which is I really like. And then um, Expecting Better is another book by that same author that um, is highly recommended. And then just a couple more. I, I try to cre keep a whole list of everything that um, my friends send me as well and s who are OBGYNs. And, Happiest Baby on the Block is about the fourth trimester, and so kind of how to recreate the womb in the first three months of um, after you deliver. And then um, 
Baby Wise is another book that kind of talks about uh, baby sleep patterns and how to help with those. So there's, there's a lot of information on the internet and I would say that you shouldn't trust everything you read. So if there's anything that you're not sure about or um, if there's something specific you want an answer to, I would recommend that you come to us first so we can point you to the right resources because there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, and uh, not everything that you see online is based on you know, research or a lot of it's anecdotal. So there's a lot of things that you gotta take with a grain of salt. And so um, just, just be aware of that. And um, if you have any questions, I'd love to see you in my office for a preconception visit. Um, and we can go from there. But um, everyone, I hope you stay healthy, stay safe. Um, and we'll see you soon.